Ah, hello and welcome to the Firmware Emotive Podcast and you're listening to John Kai Herbert and on this episode I will be talking about unpacking pedophilia and this has been something that has been on the cards for me for a while, like a few years ago when um, the Catholic Church was going through the ringer around its child sex abuse scandal, the same level of hate was coming up around pedophiles and, and, and child abuse. So I tried to engage on social media about this and um, attempting to make the point of like, the hate pushes more people into hiding and they don't get treatment. And uh, it just feels like with what, what's going on now with like the QAnon stuff and cuties and just uh, and Biden and a whole bunch of other stuff that's coming up around um, pedophilia and child molestation and child trafficking that it just some it needs it needs attention. So I'm going to shine some light on it. I'll also like to add um, if you feel uncomfortable during this podcast, I would recommend just stop and like take some time to sit with whatever's coming up for you. There is no need to endure the pain or um, the tension or whatever is going on in your body. Like, there's no need to endure it. Like during podcasts, you know, we can like get really heady and intellectual about it and. And then we forget what's going on in our body. So I encourage you to take care of yourself. And like in all my podcasts, I make myself available to you. So if something comes up for you, if it brings up a memory, if it brings up something that you need to explore, like send me a message, you know, like talk about it. Like I'm not going to try and fix you. And I just want to give you an outlet. Like, oh, this is what came up for me. Like, I heard this bit and this is what came up for me. And, you know, it's like, it reminds me of all of this. And you know, I feel really sad about what's going on in the world. And I feel so helpless and hopeless. And whatever it is, like, just share it. Like, there's no need to hide. There's no need to endure. Um, and it requires a bodily awareness, which takes practice. So, the subheading of this I titled, Who is the Man in the Mirror? Um, so unpacking pedophilia, who is the man in the mirror? And if you're looking at this on my YouTube, you will see the slides that I prepared to keep me on track, <laughs> keep me focused. It's a good chance I could um, go a bit abstract and go off on tangents and forget where I've come from. And I'll be taking sips of water as I go, which will be for a little bit of anxiety and for my mouth is parched. So who is the man in the mirror? And that came to me last night and um, I was just sitting, I was just meditating and, and that just came through, like what, what, what could the tagline be? And who is the man in the mirror? It reminded me of Michael Jackson straight away. Like for me, Michael Jackson was and is um, a huge part of my musical upbringing, like my whole family's upbringing, like my... My mom and my dad, like, they were in the era of Michael Jackson and Jackson 5. Like, my mom was in her own band that was kind of like the Jackson 5. And my dad can't play an instrument for, <laughs> to save his life. And he's so passionate about music. Like, wall to walls of vinyl. Um, so, Michael Jackson was a huge part. One of my first vinyls was Michael Jackson's Bad. So, I got... Um, a Robert Palmer vinyl and a Michael Jackson vinyl when I was um, preteen, and so for me, uh, Michael Jackson and his story through his journey with um, his accusations around um, child molestation. Um, this feels like it's all it's all interwoven here. Do I need to? Yeah, I'll briefly touch on Michael Jackson's. Like, there's. I've posted all of the references that I, I, I looked at during this podcast and there's studies and there's theses and there's web links. I've used Wikipedia as well. Wikipedia's got a good um, platform to find other studies and where things are linked. So for me, it's like, okay, cool. Wikipedia's like a good 
like a tree trunk or a fruit. You know, where did that? Where's the roots? So where's the roots? If I find Wikipedia really good to find roots for things, uh, so um, I've used that. Some YouTube videos, and so with Michael Jackson's case, like he was uh, accused of various acts of child molestation, and some stuff he settled out of court. Some things was to were taken to court, and a lot of his testimony, he, he he's a as a man that was very innocent, and um, you can spin, you can. And I'm not trying to convince you of this, like you can take whatever it is that you want to take from you know, Michael Jackson, and and you can forge your own opinion. And he, he's just a very innocent man. And like his childhood was stunted very early on, and you can see this in how his parents treated him. You can see how he was shot to fame during the Jackson Five, um, and a very very hard split in Michael Jackson. Um, I would, I'd put him down to schizoid, schizoidal, twenty first century schizoid man. Um, so for me, it's. Uh, MJ Michael Jackson had um, it is a very confused past, and he would allow kids to sleep in his bed. And I encourage you to feel out what that feels like for you, having a man with kids that are not his own sleeping in his own bed. Um, I would encourage you during this podcast to question, like when you are looking at a man walking with a child that doesn't always look like his own. What's the fears that come up for you? What are the projections that come up for you? In some of the men's groups that I'm in, men feel like they get judged for just being with their child, like playing with their child at the playground. So there's like this this collective projection that all men are predators. All men are out to get. And I feel like um, this is a collective thing and I feel like it's been spun in a in a corrupt way through some of the late stage movements we have at the moment where women are hurt, women do not know how to protect their offspring or their kin so they use their techniques of how to do it which is which is like coercion and manipulation. You now you sow, sow the fear and um, so like, who is the man in the mirror? So a lot of this will be around reflection. Like, who are you? Who who is the who is the the person that you see that looks out in the world is is how you see yourself. Um, the other image that comes to mind when I think of that is a lot of my friends and um, women that I've partnered with have had abusive pasts, and um, the image that I see and, and some of the very close men that I have have been like abused by fathers or uncles and some of the women that I've been abused by um, men in their in their, their close circles like as I see them as children in the mirror and then their perpetrator in the background like in the, in the same reflection so for me this was a very powerful imagery for me to, 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 to take into this podcast I'll jump around a bit. There's a good chance that the way my brain works is quite abstract. So I might jump around and come back and hopefully this this records correctly and I don't need to do it again and I'm not attached if I need to. Sometimes when I'm speaking, more thoughts come in or sometimes my technology dies and stops working or... I go back to listen to the podcast and the audio audio didn't come through. So for me, it's just like laying that found those neural pathways, like those new links, and connecting into my heart and like, well, what was that? Was that something that I really needed to say? So the first slide here, after the title slide, is pedophilia taboo, and it feels like it's a topic that's very challenging to talk to. Um, people get triggered so quickly by it. The the notion that um, there are people out there that are willing to um, enact their sexual um, proclivities on someone that is an innocent. 
And pedophilia is so much more than that. So, so there's a stereotype around pedophiles, like it's this bald man in a minivan, you know, lurking outside schools, like taking photos of schools. It's the, it's the overweight, um, still living in his mother's basement, um, looking at child porn on on Pornhub or whatever it is that you find it um, in the dark web, like just furiously masturbating in his in his mother's basement. And what happens is when that stereotypes are damaging uh, and they're funny and they're damaging. So everything is on a spectrum. So in this particular case, um, not only does the stereotype disengage you from connecting to the the, the, the core human, it also puts up a, a false sense of security around people that are around you. And I'll jump into statistics in one of the later slides. Um, it also creates ignorance, uh, and which represses and suppresses feelings, like it, it 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 suppresses and represses your own feelings around like what's going on for your end and your own sexuality, um, and then not understanding mental illness and and sexual um, deviancy and and how people are raised and how your childhood shapes your adulthood and it's also used as a character assassination so um, because there's such a taboo around it, it's a weighted term it becomes a slur it's like oh you're a pedophile it's like well how do you how do you respond to that well, it's like a lot of the slurs that are being used at the moment like racist and um, xenophobic and anti-semitic and there's a whole bunch of slurs that just shoot down any constructive argument or constructive dissecting of like are you a human being like are you willing to explore this like is there are you willing to um, own that there's parts of this that you do not understand and are you willing to come to a, like a higher vibration of understanding or a deeper sense of understanding of your fellow your fellow kin <laughs> so is pedophilia taboo Yes, it is very taboo, and it is taboo because you do not understand it. We do not understand it as a civilization. There's a clinical and a public reception around pedophilia that makes it taboo to talk about. So whenever somebody tries to uh, um, dissect it, it, it's met with retribution. And like, oh, you must be a pedophile yourself, you're defending it. It's like, well, it's not about defending it, it's about understanding it. So I feel like when you come from a, a space of curiosity, like be a beginner, like be a beginner today, be a beginner during this podcast, like allow yourself to like just reset, <laughs> get your textbook out, this is your first day of class, you know, your new teacher, new lessons, like what is it there, what is there to learn here, what notes can you take? Next, next slide, what is the clinical versus public reception? Of pedophilia, so the DSM you know, was a disorder of, of sexual preference, and and we we see the same with the homosexuality and, and other forms of sexuality, and there was some criticism around how that was worded, how pedophilia was worded around sexual preference. Um, so there was later revisions which revised that, like pedophilia isn't a sexual preference; it's um it's a, there's a disorder there. And I want to state this very, very fucking clearly. Like, a lot of us have disorders. So, parading around, like that you've never been to a therapist, or you've been to a therapist and you realized that you were okay, doesn't mean you have like this purity around you. So when I say it's a disorder, it means like it's outside of the norm. It's like it's something that culturally we it, it's not wise for us to to go down a path of seeing that having sex with children is a sexual preference because we know the damage that it can do. So culturally, we we make a made a choice and, and ethically that innocence is innocence and consent is important and all and the power that you have over somebody who is innocent and that could include somebody who has some kind of mental disorder that doesn't allow them to be discerning, 
that, that there is a responsibility there that we do not take advantage of that. And that happens to in aged care, that happens in all forms of systems and hierarchies where somebody else is in charge of taking care of you. So legal wise, the legality was that there's um so there's pedophilia and there's very many there's lots of filias. And so the legal term is a child molester. So the the DSM and the clinical term is like, well this is the this is the umbrella. Like this is the lens that, that, that we're looking through it, okay? And you can have this disorder and you can be non contact. Like you can not go out of your way to try and find a way to live out your sexual fantasies on someone who is innocent. If you choose to do that, then and you're prosecuted, then you move into a child molester. So I feel like this is a very important discernment to make, is that you can have the disorder and not be a child molester. And I touched on before around the pejorative, around it's an, in, an insult and to discredit. Not only to discredit um, the person, but also their organization. So, um, like the church, like I, I grew up in a, in a religious family. So for me, like there's a shadow in me that would just love to see like the church d- destroyed. And um, I feel like there are some very good things that come out of the church and some very unhealthy maladaptive things that come out of church in general and the same thing with if, if you love um like antifa at the moment like antifa has got um a pedophile problem so um there might be elements in antifa that are um, when they first started like let's let's fight whatever this um, this system let's fight like let's be anti-fascist whatever it is and then Within that that organisation, there are men that have pedophilic tendencies, so it can be used as an insult to describe on both sides of the political spectrum. And this is where it's like, when it's weighted, when it's used as like a a pejorative to insult and discredit. You're not it's you're not getting to the nitty gritty. You're you're dismissing the human because you you don't like an organisation, regardless of whether it's the church or antifa or whatever. Idiot compassion. Now, this is where we see, um, like, we want to try and turn pedophilia and people attracted to minors into a sexual preference. Uh, And we also see in um, younger children dancing provocatively, um, like at, um, at, like, strip clubs and, like, they're dressed up to be sexually provocative. And, we will, and and the same thing in um, cuties as well. I mean, I'll I'll touch, I'll jump around on cuties. So cuties is a new Netflix special that's that's come out, and it's about um, girls that twerk. And the whole intention of it was not to be about sexualizing women, but it feels like there's an element of failure in doing that, and that is okay. So there's like, this idiot compassion around. Like oh we need to we need to allow for this like we need to allow for um, like people who are attracted to minors to to live this out to be to be public to be okay with it and this is where like we we try and give a minority who's disempowered more power than than what is necessary so we try and overpower a minority which is part of like this intersectional feminism I'm bumping the microphone like a lunatic here intersectional feminism tries to like make a make um put on a pedestal people of a minority people who are ridiculed people who are um uh, uh, are downtrodden like the underdog and for me like I love an underdog fight I'm a big fan about it and it feels like this is the answer to when you don't look at something holistically, so when you have like a an authoritarian type approach to like, oh, you know, all pedophiles are evil, and you don't understand the underlying foundation, this is the answer to it. So you, we end up just creating what we fear anyway. So you've got to own that. Wow, deja vu. Big deja vu. Mm. Oh, I never know how to, how to. I never know how to handle deja vu because it feels like. <laughs> 
Like, do I try and go as deep as I can into it and see like where this takes me, or do I like double down on my presence? Um, wow. Okay. Hmm. Then we've got virtuous pedophiles, and I've got a link to their their website below in my in my in my bibliography. And they're, they're, they're aiming for accountability. Like they're called virtuous pedophiles, where like they are either self-diagnosed or clinically diagnosed, and they don't act like they're just doing their best to live their lives um, while watching what's going on inside them. And then community awareness-wise, we have offender registries. And this is where... Like, you have been tagged as a child molester and then you're put into an offender registry. And now the statistics around offenders is that they re-offend. It is a, an uncomfortable number around re-offending pedophiles, re-offending child molesters, I should say. So there's community awareness around that. And I feel like, there, there's a space for that. There's a space for um, having that community awareness and loving the other person through this disorder. Not trying to chase them out of town, not trying to like burn crucifixes in their front yard, not like treating them as a non-human. Um, there is, there is a balance that we can find here, and it requires. If you're anti, if you you get very triggered by talking about child molestation and and pedophilia, and in a way where you you want to lash out and seek vengeance, then this is your work. Because, man in the mirror wise, this could have been you. Um, Also on this slide I've got here, maladaptive disordered relating. So... Um, there's a lot of rejection for people that have been clinically diagnosed with pedophilia or some kind of philia. um, There's this narrative of failure where it's like you failed at being human, which can spiral into depression and anxiety and, and suicide. And like some of you might cheer like, oh yeah, why dead pedophiles are good pedophiles. Like, fuck you. Like, it's it's not that straightforward. And again, man in the mirror. It could have been you. Like if you if you are struggling with a disorder, it could be it could be any disorder, like a bipolar, it could be um anxiety or depression or anything like that. Like if you're around happy people all the time and you, you know you they know that you're depressed and they don't want you around because you know you you bring all their energy down. It's like, "Oh man, I'm so glad, you know, you finally killed himself or herself because He's just bringing all the energy down. It made me feel uncomfortable. And good riddance. It's like this is this is bridging this humanity, and balancing, not going into idiot compassion. And you can look up idiot compassion. Being discerning. So narratives of failure is something that plays out in this community, where it pushes them deeper into repression, and they don't want to look at it. Like it just becomes sadness and it spirals into more disease. And on the other side of the spectrum, we've got healthy, respectful relating, where like there's there's consent involved and they're socially rewarded. So like people that, that can simultaneously watch this disorder playing out inside them and not acting on it needs to be socially rewarded. Um, and, I, and I feel like that's where we take all disease, all kinds of this illness, illnesses where, bumping the microphone again, all kinds of illnesses where um, you are shunned. And I feel like this is something that, that politically that um, the conservative right does. And to generalize here, like me- mental illness is seen on the conservative right as like you have failed. You're a failure at life. And then on the left, it's like, I'll love everyone. Um, this is on the, on the deep left, the far left. And I'm generalizing here, guys. This is what I'm seeing. It's like, I'll love everyone. Like, everyone should be able to just be free and 
even in California that they've lowered the lowered the age on um, consent. So that was concerning for me. Um, like your brain next, I'm just jump to the next slide and running off on a tangent here. Like your brain doesn't fully form until you're 25. Up until that moment in time, you are running on your emotions. Yeah, I think it's the amygdala. Like you are an emotional being. Like the, your discernment is very little. So at a biological level, to be able to understand power dynamics and power shift dynamics and... and um, and, and someone that is taking advantage of you or um, is is challenging. So I feel like there's a respect and and duty of care that is required when you're in a position of power over somebody else. And when, as a civilization, that we need to make decisions for the innocent. Mm. So that sloshing around you here is me drinking from my water bottle. Repeat offenders. So statistics on pedophilia. What are the statistics on pedophilia? Repeat offenders is high. So, and I feel like this is a treatment, quote, end quote, failure. We do not know how to deal with this properly. So we're trying to use like chemical castration and CBT and techniques that do not work. And I feel it's because it's, you're not looking at the lower self. Previous victims become predators so um, if you've been subject to incest if you've been subject to some form of child molestation you are at a higher risk at becoming at having pedophilic tendencies or enacting that out on your children so for anybody that can heal from this space and have children like and, and treat those children with respect and, and be able to own, like, your past and own your pain and own your hurt. Like, you are fucking heroes in my book. Like, if you can navigate that valley of death, like, I can, I'm getting emotional about it. Like, if you can navigate that valley of death, like, you are you are heroes in my book. Because that shit is, is fragmenting and it's, it, it's, it's, it's hurtful and it's a, it's a visceral betrayal of everything that humanity... Um, is children as sex offenders a lot of underage kids are sex offenders and I feel like this dovetails into the sexualization of children where like when you hit your teens your hormones are starting to um, amp up and you don't know how to you don't know how to relate to this especially if your family has a history of sexual shame like if you can't talk about like arouse, if you can't talk about erections, ejaculation, menstruation, like wet dreams, like if you can't talk about that stuff and you've got kids at school that have like got access to, to like um, their dad's um, skin mags or like their their mother's like um what I can I can quote unquote empowered woman and, and, and doesn't contextually understand sexuality and how how impressionable it can be on young kids then children just become sex offenders you know and then you you perpetuate this cycle of of abuse so there's a children as sex offenders the statistics are high um this is continuing on from statistics on pedophilia they're underreported so that's a big deal so in especially in religious communities it's underreported so typically the victim gets shamed and the perpetrator goes free because they doesn't want to upset the community so that it goes underreported um you got the church underreporting like in in Australia we had a, a super church um who's the the father one of one of the the lead preachers in the super church were molested some children i can't remember if it was one or a couple either one is enough and his son kept it a secret because he didn't want the image of the church smeared and this is it and this is, I, I speak about this in my other podcast around crooked kings and queens 
Um, but, but basically, the statistics on pedophilia are underreported, which means that it, there's a good chance that what we are seeing on the surface, there's a bigger iceberg underneath. And based on how people respond to the term pedophilia and child molesters in general, I can see why. Um, outrage is important. I'll, 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 outrage is important because it's, it's a litmus. However, it's, 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 it's very challenging to make change from an outrage place. Um, investigations get silenced, and this is part of that underreported, like, who was it? Oh, who was I talking to? I got a Gene Keys reading yesterday, and um, he mentioned, what was his name? Thomas Atwood? Someone Atwood. Uh, a really good true crime podcast. He was talking about, like, he he made this guy went to prison, and, and he was um, very connected to the mafia, and... And he found out like just how big some of this child trafficking, sex trafficking stuff is. And investigations would get silenced because it would start to put a looking glass on people in authority. And for me, that's terrifying. And we've had the same thing in Australia. We had a, a royal commission into child molestation. And some of the documents that were presented with the, the investigations were halted because previous prime ministers were identified as being child molesters. So this is a big deal. Big deal. So this is like this is we're looking at the foundations of people in authority um acting out their sexual deviancy on people that are innocent beings that are innocent, souls that are innocent. Um, it's not prioritized. So because it's it, the investigations are silenced and it's underreported, it's not really prioritized. And it's very challenging to prioritize something when those two things are in play, when it's underreported and investigations are silenced. Because the statistics feed the systems that heal. So how can you... When you when when a lot of data feeds a lot of these programs, that's how budgets are budgets are constructed. That's how people like oh wow that's a big deal. Let's prioritize that. Same thing with like all the stuff that goes on as a civilization. Like we we're guided by data, um, and for me it's like you got to be guided by the heart. However, there's people that just need the data still, and that's okay. So it's not prioritized because the data is incorrect. The data is not transparent enough. Um, Church and religion are the highest um, offenders currently. And so people that were, that was, and this is data based. So there could be it could be other segments of civilization that have a much higher um, infiltration of child molesters that we just don't have the data for. So then there was the Catholic Church was one of the highest um, statistics wise. So like, and you can see that there's a this this reoccurring theme in organizational power and taking advantage of innocence and this is part of that lower self as part of that shadow um, where you can talk about it till you're blue in the face whether this is a bodily ownership of what's going on and this is like sexual splits blocks the whole shebang um, and the other statistics here is um grooming the family so a lot of child molesters or people that um, want to act out on their pedophilic fantasies will groom the family. And the children that are at highest risk are when parents feel inadequate. Um, there's a parental inadequacy. So the parents aren't there, um, either emotionally or physically. And then somebody can step in there to be that parent. And that's the pernicious path. Parental unavailability, like um, single mums, um, single dads, um, you work, you can't afford to be at home to take care of the kids, so you might have like a friend that comes around or a neighbour that comes around, and that's high risk situation. Um, Parent-child conflict, so if your relationship with your kids, if you don't know how to repair, like if you don't know how to love unconditionally, and like, like your kid's going to go through their own shit. And you need to be able to repair. Like, do you want to talk about this? Like, what happened? Like, like I felt like, I felt, like, be able to express your feelings and not be able to like, not 
<laughs> expect your child to take caretake for you. Like this is you got to be able to own that. And I feel it's a challenging in parenting. Like that's the rite of passage in parenting, especially in the current generation, is being able to own your feelings and not expect your child to fucking caretake for you. And that poor parent-child relationship, um, where, like, you do need to caretake for your your, your mother or your father. Like they might have an alcohol issue, or they they don't know how to look after themselves. Like whatever it is, like, like or um, there's abuse there, like verbal abuse, um, and shaming and criticism, and like I'm, I've got my, one of my closest sisters. Um, uh, like she kind of extradited herself from the family because of a poor parent-child relationship. Um, so it's con- constantly being shamed, constantly being criticised. It's like, well, fuck you all. So it's like, and she was of all my siblings. I feel like she was the highest risk of of being taken advantage of sexually. She was the most sexually liberated out of all of us. So. That feels like the end of that statistic. That slide. I'll probably jump around to statistics. Now, this slide is one I've been very keen to get to. How do you know if you're a pedophile? How do you know? How do you know you potentially have like a part of your your makeup that has a monster... It's a child molester. Now, a few years ago when I was touching on this, I was like, well, how do you know? Like, how do I know that I'm not a pedophile? How do I know that I'm not, a, like, aroused by, like, um, minors? And it was like, I discovered, like, penile plethysmography or fel- or phallometry. The penile plethysmography. <laughs> Basically, um, and there's one for women as well called vaginal photoplesthomography. Um, basically, they, they, they work out how much blood flow um, or um, the amount of, of, of the potential difference, the difference in blood flow to your sexual organs. There's a, so there's a test, a sexual orientation test, and I've got the video... A link to a video on that in in my references, where there was a I can't remember the name of the guy. He was on a sex show from the UK, and he was watching. He was trying to work out. He wasn't trying to work out. He just wanted to do it as an experiment. So they attached this um, device to his penis, and they put him in like a head brace. And if you've seen <laughs> um, Clockwork Orange, you know, it's, it's not as bad as that. Um, he's just trying to. Um, uh, this, is, this is the device that he's, he puts his head in, rests his, his chin on, and he's watching a whole bunch of videos, and they can track where your eye goes. And um, it's really interesting technology because um, it was a it was a combination of of measuring what the penis was doing and where your eyes were going and how your eyes were responding. So sometimes you might not respond sexually, however, your eyes. You, wherever you, you, you move your eyes to, um, that's where you can get an, an even better idea about what your orientation is, what, you, what excites you as a human being. So in this particular YouTube video, um, they, they played some, some um, male-on-male porn, um, some women-on-woman porn, and some male-on-woman porn. And... The experiment showed quite clearly that he was gay, and he is. Um, and there was a when he was looking at the the male on female porn, um, like just it was the the way his eyes moved, the way the results moved for his eyes was there was a a curiosity but no excitement. So I was like, oh yeah, what's going on here? Like it's just like you're looking around a room, like like oh yeah, there's some books on the shelf and a plant over there and. Like there's like a there's a level of disinterest that make that correlates with um, your lack of sexual arousal. So how do you know if you're a pedophile? Well, you know you gotta you gotta be curious because you might have these tendencies within you. So if you're quick to shame others, 
around. Um, oh, you are this, you are that. Like, man in the mirror, woman in the mirror. There's a good chance, you know, you could have the, you could have these tendencies as well. So, this is where like that purity, like purity testing comes about. It's like throwing the first stone and like, like who are you to judge? Like, and I feel like contextually judging is important and I, I feel like looking at yourself first is, is, is always going to yield the best results. So if you want to look those up, and I don't know if there'll be a test in your area if you're keen to try that out, but there are devices that can be used to test this. For women, it can be a little bit different. Um, it, the, the device can be a bit more uncomfortable because it's inserted. Um, so um, that can correlate with like a false reading because you've got something inside you. It's like it's not... It's, um, it's just different. So for a man, there's less of a, um, a, a physical interruption. Um, and I speak for myself and the testimonials of other men that have done that particular test. Okay. PAMs. What are PAMs and MAPs? Contact and non-contact. So, in my research on this, I went to a few forums. And one of the forums I went to was... Um, I, uh, persons attracted to minors and minor attracted persons. So there's, there's this attempt to try and um, double speak um, pedophilia into less of a derogatory term. And of course, like, if you're running from it, like, you're just going to create what you fear anyway. So, like, you've got, um, and I was part of this. Like, I was like, what, the, what is a PAM? Like, what is a MAP? Like, what is actually going on here? And it's in, it, the intention is to try and alleviate a lot of the stigma around a pedophilic diagnosis. So, I get what they're trying to do, and it's it's backfiring, because I thought like, we're just trying to turn it into a sexual preference now. And if it's not, if it's, if you're not in a clinical space and exploring this, then yes, this is the pernicious path where it just becomes a sexual preference instead of a disorder. Of, of sexual orientation. So PAMs and MAPs are, it's a philia. So it is, it is a, um, a pedophilia. And there's, there's a couple of pedophilia, there's a couple of um, philias, there's subcategories of like, the different age groups that the, 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 the client or the person that's got the diagnosis is, is, is um, associated with. So different age groups can have different terms in, in, in regards to their philia. So within the PAMs and the MAPS community, there was contact and non-contact, and this was disturbing. I found I felt disturbed about this because it's 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 kind of like you're trying to double speak your way into like a a contact and non-contact space. So, and again, like if somebody is touching a child and they're getting aroused by it, um. I don't know how to. I don't. I don't. I honestly don't know how to, to finish that sentence. Um, yeah, I don't know how to finish that sentence. Why do people seek vengeance and justice? It's like here you go. It's, like, it's this is where, when you don't own your own your lower self, own your shadow, own your shit, um, then this this vengeance and justice, like becoming a, becoming your own vigilante of like what you think is right um, doesn't help because um, you, you might you might go out and look, tarnish a person's reputation it's like, well, for what? like you just push people that actually want to come forward into the woodwork it's like so outrage, fear, ignorance, injustice and repeat offenders. So there's because of the outrage, because people don't know how to handle this outrage of having seeing someone being taken advantage of, especially if you were taken advantage if your innocence was was taken advantage of and if you still hold that outrage, it's in your bodily system. Like you just got to own it. Like own that outrage, it becomes part of your body, you own it and then your presence changes. Um you're, you are no longer live in fear, and you can speak from a place of authority, which rattle, which will rattle bones. 
And that's what I want for men and women, is you own that outrage. It doesn't mean that those horrible things didn't happen to you. It means that you're not reacting out of this space that is not creative. It is, it is, it is, it is pure, it is, it is destruction with no outcome. This is pure, just anarchy. Um, fear. So people seek vengeance and justice out of fear because you don't understand, because you feel like, um, well, what happens if it's my kids? You know, and you, you empathize with everyone around you and then you just create this fear of, of you don't want this to happen to you, you don't want this to happen to your cousins or your nephews. So you're like, well, let's just kill them. Let's get, out, get, us, get, get them. Get them all. Which ties in with the ignorance. And because you don't understand, um, there's a there's an element of like, well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do what feels right because you know this is wrong, this is morally apprehensible, and, and it needs to be taken care of. And there's a hell of a lot of injustice. So what I mentioned before, around like organisations silencing investigations, people in authority and power that you trust to be just and be responsible with their power and then statistics like when there's injustice there is going to be outrage when there's injustice there's going to be fear because the things that we place our trust in are not sound and then the ignorance well like and i hate to use this term but wake up like the ignorance around that people are people People are people everywhere. And just because they've got a fucking badge, because they wear a wig in court, because they've spent years at university studying something to be an authority on it, they're still people. They're still going to have sexual tendencies. They're still going to want to protect their own interests or their family or or their structures of control. So, like, when there's injustice, like, it's, 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 it, it spawns a lot of this. And inner injustice is integrity. So if you are unjust in yourself, like if you do not know how to own your sexual fantasies, um, then this is something that's going to play out in you. So if you have like, um, like if say you've been in a relationship for a long time, and it's like you just want to feel somebody else's touch on your body, then you need to be able to vocalize that. And it might result in the destruction of your relationship. Or you need to be able to own it and say, no, that's okay, Like I can take care of myself. I can pleasure myself. I don't need somebody else. So when there's, if there's inner integrity that is out of place, then there's going to be injustice everywhere. Because you are effectively those people in positions of power and authority. You put them there. You become them. So authority and power are a volume control on the shadow. So if you do not know how to control, not how to control, address your shadow, look at your shadow, and sexual shadow is going to be big this year. Like, it's coming, and I love it because I thrive in this space, and I love to, I love seeing people free. You are free. So I love seeing, I love seeing that growth. I love seeing that. Like it, 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 it fills me <laughs> with a passion and energy that I could just like <laughs> run through walls. The other reason why people seek vengeance and justice is repeat offenders. And we see this time and time again, like someone's case gets cut short and they, they re-offend. Like during COVID, we had sexual offenders released from prison. And what do they do? Offended. Like... It's maddening. <laughs> like we have, we have systems um, to the people that are high risk of reoffending to put them away. And I'm not saying that's a great idea because I feel like rehabilitation is something that is important and those tools for rehabilitation aren't that great. However, re repeat offenders is a thing. So... When you let someone out of they've they've finished early or they've 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 served or they've been a good boy or girl behind bars and they get out and they repeat offend, it's like outrage. It's like how could this person be released? It's because people can change their behaviour to get outcomes. You know, if 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 someone's a if someone 
groomed a family for years, like doing a, a stint in prisons, a, a cakewalk. You know, you just you just know how to behave. You just learn how to behave. This is part of the, the this is part of that the the emotional plague that Wilhelm Reich talks about, which I'll touch on later as well. And like, you just know how to behave. You learn what is the correct way to behave in whatever system that you are in, so you can just get what it is that you really want. So you behave in prison, you know, you talk to the the chaplain, you know, you volunteer for things and and this is the collective shadow, you know. This is like you just you pretend to be something that you are not to get what you really want. Instead of just like asking for what you want or being authentic and whether you get it or not, you just need to deal with the consequence. Spit and hot fire. Okay. How is this a crime of opportunity against the innocent? Okay. I'm just drop into my body a bit more. Ah, okay. So this perpetuates the cycle of abuse. And if you're if you work in a clinical practice, if you've ever done any research on sexual abuse, like, abusers uh, have a very high chance at becoming, oh, uh, sorry, the abused have a very high chance of becoming abusers. So, um, this is where that healing is so important. Like, it's a crime of opportunity because of the innocence that is betrayed here. Like that, that moment of vulnerability, like in in adulthood, like pe- that men that um, like slip roofies into women's drinks, like you are trying to make them more innocent, less less aware. You're trying to take away their consent, try take away their ability, take away their discernment. So on the flip side, as a ch- with a child, like they are just pure innocence, like especially sexually like there's a there's like oh this person trusts me like even with stranger the concept of stranger danger like when when I was growing up like this whole concept of stranger danger it's not in with in regards to child molestation it's not the strangers that are the highest risk of perpetrating it's a family member or a close family member like a next door neighbor or a cousin or something like that so and that's what makes it hard because they this person, the molester, can be in part of that that whole the whole family in the community dynamic, and in particularly in religious communities, the victim just gets hung out to dry. Because the community, especially if you come from like a war torn country, or somewhere where community is 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 life or death, and you can't you haven't expanded your tribe out to include more, then. Um, you, you, it's 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 devastating. So, um, um, one of the one of the women that I've been quite close to, um, so she was molested by a, a family member, and her whole family turned on her. And for me, like that was devastating for me because her soul. I'm getting emotional. Her soul is so beautiful. This is such a beautiful woman. And, um, so for me, like for her to heal, whatever it is that she's, she's working through and it's layer by layer, like her being able to speak her truth and come out and speaking her truth against her family was powerful and, and, and terrifying for her. And same thing with men in my community as well that have like spoken out about like whether they were abused by a family member or another, like for them just to talk about it. Like, there's so much shame, especially for men, around being sexually abused. Um, around, like, it's a, it's, 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 it's a thieving of your manhood. And if you speak about it, you know, you're, like, you're less than a man. And and being able to, 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 to witness a man speak from that place where his manhood and his innocence was stolen is such an incredible healing balm for the masculine. So we see, like, the mainstream narrative of, like, 
or oh, all men are evil, like toxic masculinity, like all that 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 stuff which which continues to shame men. Like there's this undertow in the majority of men that 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 being able to find people that are not willing to shame them for their whatever's happened to them in the past is gold leaf. So, and these uh, the crimes of opportunity here come from a place of predatory behavior. And the same thing like we're, we're, we're teachers groom men. Um, we're teachers groom boys. Where like you're in a power, in, in, in an element of authority here and and for women that are <clears throat> that have a low sense of self-esteem, or that have that 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 low sense of self, and like a one of their students like takes a fan, uh, uh, takes a liking to them. Like I had this in my school where a teacher was was grooming one of the students, and um, and that was like pushed under the under the rug, and they're together now. They've got kids. Um, however, there was like there was a there's a groom. There's a power dynamic here. There's a shift here, and anyway, so um, where was I going with that? Uh, crime of opportunity. Teachers, yeah. So, so with 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 so we, with men in, in teachers in particular. So there's like this this like celebration that you've you've like a teacher had sex with you or was grooming you or whatever it is, and and then within men like. Um, and now at, at, at my, I have a lot of family members that are that are teachers, like they have a particular dress code, and um, being able to dress in a way that that's sensible and expressive, yet that yet isn't um, like exciting, is part of that process. So, like, if you can't have a constructive con. con- a constructive conversation around sexuality and teaching boys how to express and and direct that energy in a, in a constructive way it's going to manifest in like skinny mags gossip and like denigration and like dehumanizing of the teacher and which can also flow into like this sexual looshing around um teachers taking advantage of of students so there's a whole conversation around here and how we how we treat sexuality and how we can take it to a place where it just is and it's not this taboo thing that we keep trying to push under the rug for because the bible says so or we're going too far liberal we need some kind of middle ground of boundaries and ethics and morality here next slide what does sexualization of children have to do with pedophilia? Okay. So sexualization of children has been something that's been going on for at least a decade now. And so for some of the kids that are growing up now, like all they've known is sexualization of children. And we we can see this in Disney movies. We can see this in advertisements. We can see this online. And now children have got their own gateways through social media, like with Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat. Like, um, like I didn't get my first phone until I was like twenty four. <laughs> I've no idea. Anyway, but um, and I didn't have my uh, a computer in my own room until like. Um, mid-teens so so for me like the generation that's come through has got access to everything and so what sexualization of children has to do is is it, it, it it feeds something that is natural in them and it feeds something in adults so like sexual energy is the most powerful um biological like organic energy on the planet so it sex sells and i was watching a youtube um review on cuties and it was a guy maybe in his late 20s early th- early 30s just talking about like 
watching these 11-year-olds twerk made him sexually aroused. And he never thought that he would be sexually aroused by this. So he has, he, there's a, there was a sexual split in him around like, man, these are underage girls and I'm aroused. So there's like this, there's this, ah, my phone's ringing. I bet that's Eric. Yeah, it is Eric. My, my beautiful business partner. I'll have to answer that call later. Um, so yeah, there's this split around like he's watching this and he's getting aroused and they're underage kids. Like, how do you, like, how do you reconcile that? So like, and this is a conversation that needs to be had. So like the sexualization of children is like you're, you're taking this, this innocence into a space where, um, it's reserved for like consent and, and conversations and, um, like an, an awareness around like the, the subtle energies, like tantric energies around like, oh, this is, this is, this is, this is a shared thing. This isn't like me taking like the, there's an amazing, what's it, the Betty something wheel of consent. It's incredible. Anyway, to this slide. So in the middle of this slide, I've got sexualization in the middle and I've got imagery, music, conversation, social media, and no context. So we've got kids and this is like the pageants, like um, some of these, these the, uh, I have this image of like pageantry and like um, how we sexualize kids to like Miss Universe, like the pageants, like Miss whatever it is, pageants. It's like, like kids wearing makeup and like wearing swimming costumes and like being judged on like like judging a child at an adult thing when even at an adult level why are we judging it as well like some of the women that i've been with and and some of my clients as well um, i do make a very clear distinction about that um like the bodily issues like cellulite like their breasts are small too small like um like they struggle with the, they, when they feel bloated and they and, and like they feel like they 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 feel it's not so much um, the feeling it's more like how worthless they feel like oh yeah I feel a bit bloated and I feel a bit disgusting and there's the lambing it it's like there's this sense of like overwhelming worthlessness that gets laid over the top of like of like if I'm not being this image, dancing like this, having these conversations, act like this on social media, I'm not sexy. I'm not, I'm failing. I'm at like this narrative of failure of life. So what does it have to do with pedophilia? What does sexualization of children have to do with pedophilia? It excites a part of, 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 of the human psyche that, that, is not integrated at the moment. Um, so it creates, it's creating something that is not integrated. Um, it's feeding a beast that, and I don't know whether that's right or wrong at the moment. It just feels like this whole thing is coming to the surface and we need like a, a, a reset, like on, on, because if we're sexualizing adults, then and dehumanizing adults and only see adults as a body, then the children that are influenced by that person, same thing because we don't look to adults as role models. So the question on my slide should also be, how does sexualization of adults have to do with pedophilia? Because they're interwoven, they're not separate. How does reactive parenting feed this disease? All right. Now, where can I speak from from this place? So um, the first thing that popped to mind for me, I'm looking, just so if you're watching on my YouTube, I am looking out, out of my window at the ocean. There's something very calming. It's very still today. So I'm just like looking out there. So I'm not always looking at the camera. Sometimes I'll look at the camera and it's like, that feels correct for me. And sometimes I'll be looking at the ocean. That feels correct for me. So... How does reactive parenting feed this disease? All right, so I touched on this before. Like if you're a parent and you haven't 
integrated your sexual shit, <laughs> you're going to create what you fear. Like, on this slide, I have ignorance, shame, ideology, and virtue signaling. So, like, it might be all very well for you to jump up and down about pedophilia and child molesting and all that, all that stuff. If you haven't looked at your own sexuality, if you haven't integrated the part of you that was shamed as a child, the part of you that, that, that can't allow yourself to be intimately playful and childish with a partner, a consenting adult partner, you can't integrate that part of you that just wants to be playful, then this is part of that. You know, you're, you're shaming a part of you that was not allowed to express yourself. Um, the ignorance, so and ignorance and ideology are very intertwined. So, in like the church and in like the radical right or right or conservative right, there's this knee-jerk reaction to mental illness, like I mentioned it before, and crimes of sex, crimes or morality or ethical issues around sex, even from premarital sex. Excuse me, from premarital sex to um, like having uh, like um, mistresses and all this kind of stuff. So like, like the church. Come on, like, like if if you frame everything from like a, an ideological space, like you're just running a script. Like you need to find out what is correct for you. You need to like own what it is that you are feeling and what is the world that you want to create from a space of 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 knowing who you are not what the bible says not about like bringing about the end of days or all that kind of nonsense it's like the reactive parenting around um being fed by media news around um in the 80s there was a whole bunch of child abductions which spawned like a helicopter parenting technique where the kids knew kids knew how to behave around their parents and then when they were not around their parents they would do whatever the fuck they wanted because it just it, this it becomes about stress management for your parent so um children will do things so they don't have to deal with your stress register that so reactive parenting wise it feeds this notion of that that there's a clinical diagnosis, there's a legal um, conviction, there's a legal um, verdict, and then there's there's a, a, a tapestry and a, and a root system of how it spreads out into the community. So, teaching discernment, bodily ownership, and consent is important, and that can start at a very young age. Like um, like your your genitals are for you. And you need to be able to talk to me if somebody tries to touch you. Like if someone, you able to, need to say no, like being able to own your nose. Um, and it feels like this is, because when, ah, oh, like when you can own your nose, when you can teach your child how to own their body, we will see a, a renaissance um, of, of, of sexuality ownership. And this is something that's played out. Like, a lot of my partners that were abused um, in previous relationships, their parents, they were raised in a, in, a, in a place of shame around sexuality. Like, and these were women that were very respectful women. Like, they wouldn't go out of their, like, they, they owned who they were. They um, were not about, like, having sex with, like, whoever they wanted to have sex with. They were discerning. They were sexually discerning. And there were all these seeds of, um, like, sexual shame around who they were and their sexuality. Like, oh, you know, you've always, you, boys are always going to want to take advantage of you and you, know, you need to save yourself for marriage and, like, all of this stuff. It fed this undertow in their sexuality, which, which they ended up getting molested and abused anyway. And this is like this is one of those controversial things where it's like, oh, you you were you were responsible for your own abuse. And it's like it's more complicated than that. Like, it's so much more complicated than that. Like, 
having your innocence taken away from you, having having your um, your body violated by someone else is fucking abhorrent. And I cannot use that word any stronger. Like it is gross. It's a it's a visceral betrayal of everything that humanity is. So yeah. I feel like it's it's more complicated than that. However, parents do not help when they do not own their own sexuality, step away from and not step away from ideologies and religious constructs. Like it's about giving you brought a child into the world to learn. Your child is your best teacher. They will show you things about yourself that no therapist, no healer could ever show you. So you need to learn from them. Not in, not, not sow these discords of um, re- ideology inside of them and fear inside of them. Teach them discernment, not fear. What is the emotional plague in a healthy sex economy? Yeah, Wilhelm Reich. All right, this guy. And... Um, Lower self work. Mm. Another sip of water. Down to. Looks like two thirds. Okay. So the emotional plague. So the emotional plague, I, I encourage you to do some research on Wilhelm Reich and the emotional plague <clears throat> and where we, where we are at with that right now. So, like, he. I'm going to say so like a lot. So likes a lot. So with the emotional plague. It was about, like, you. people were just disconnected from their bodies. Like, they did not know how to react authentically, completely disconnected from their heart and their sexuality, and, like, you you wouldn't be able to give your heart and your sexuality to one person. You'd, you'd have it split between people. Like, you could not speak your truth or... And part of that was... Like having children be able to express their sexuality as well, and this is where like the the conservative right um, were trying to push some of Wilhelm Reich's works into the realms of like oh it's encouraging pedophilia, it's encouraging child molestation, um, and his intention was not to do that. It was about trying to create a foundation where everybody can freely talk about sex and conserve the innocence of those that are within power dynamics. So, a healthy sex economy is like, you just people are just f- freer to express how they feel. And I'll concentrate on the adult component of this now, because we haven't even got that down yet. <laughs> so there's no point in trying to like, the, the chicken, egg, egg chicken... Um, so, like, authenticity, like, at the moment, excuse me while I yawn and speak, so authenticity at the moment for me, like, being able to express myself authentically, and like, oh, I feel aroused, I'd love to touch you here, um, and just allow the space for that is priceless, like, and that's come through in my healing work as well, where... Like men and women can just freely speak about whatever is going on for them sexually, and then we can go wherever it is that we need to go session wise in order to integrate or expose whatever it is is in their way. And that involves a lot of body awareness, so like deep tissue, and for me, like in my own massage that I give, um, like I just intuitively find pressure points in the body. Where trauma is held, I don't understand how the hell I do it. I just do it, and it works. So the body will twitch in a certain place. Oh, okay, let's hold this spot and hold this spot, and then like just wait, and then you know, the whole body just starts to like twitch, like it's it's quite uncanny. And then um, as that escalates, and the might the the person might cry, or the person might grieve, or rage, or whatever it is. So. And part of that process is being able to allow a full orgasmic release. So, um, like when you hold back, like, and for men, like, 
maintaining an erection is more important than like being able to orgasm like just allowing yourself to orgasm and then like if you feel shame around it then just feel the shame you know um like for me with with partners like if i come before they do i'm like i i have no either i can finish you off or you can finish yourself off like i i like it's for me it's like the end, the end goal it's it's not about the end goal of coming it's about the journey about the connection about the the heat and the passion and um the curiosity oh my right ears ringing what am i not listening to um so and then consent so a healthy sex economy is about consent as well so it's about having that conversation like giving and taking and and if you look at Betty, I'm going to have to find it. I'm have to go- no, I'm not going to Google it. I'm just going to leave it, John. It doesn't have to be perfect. There's a, a wheel of consent. Just look, look up Betty and wheel of consent. It is next level. I learned about it in ISTA level one. It's changed the way I relate to people that I am in contact with, um, especially in my my massage practice. And if like, and I if I massage a partner. Um, then I disconnect from that, 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 that sexual place and go into a place of service. And it's like, like it's my energy and I'm treating you right now. It's not about me um, um, using, like pushing my energy into you so I can get something sexual later. Um, and if I am going to mix the two, I'm very transparent about it. It's like, you know what, I'd, I'd love to massage your ass tonight and I'm going to get some enjoyment out of massaging your bum and seeing you enjoy that as well. Um, so for me, that's where I'm just being transparent and honest and that's down to the person and whether or not they want to experience that as well. So I feel like for me in a healthy sex economy, it's purely about that. It's like, let's be honest. And for me, like, if I said something and then that caused like, such a big rift in the relationship that it ended then that is what i want i don't want to pretend like if if i speak my truth and it ended up becoming the end of a relationship then that is what i want like trying to have your cake and eat it too is like it's incorrect it's out of integrity it's inauthentic and we need to be aware of it which is a bodily awareness thing when you can take care of yourself sexually and be able to own yourself sexually, it's, it's, there's less effort <laughs> trying to find the person of your dreams. And and how does that playing with pedophilia? Is like, you learn to take care of yourself. You learn, and I feel like this is where like a lot of the modalities that we have in the mainstream do not address this. Like, I feel like there's an element in, in, in Tantra that can help a person connect to their body and help look at what's really going on for them. Okay, next slide. How does celibacy and hypocrisy and sex positive feed this disease? Oh, oh, all right. So I see all of these as conditioning where like enforced celibacy of like trying to remain pure in the eyes of God um, feeds like these acts of opportunism and we see that in the church like you can't suppress your sexuality cannot do it it's just going to come out in some other way um, and that the sh- sexual shadow is strong and you can only suppress that for so long before it, it'll come out in some other way so it feeds the disease because you can't, you have no outlet, so you end up like just finding whatever it is as an outlet um, and, and just using using it. Like it becomes, whatever you target that sexual energy with just becomes a receptacle, which is gross, of your sexual energy. Um, yeah. Uh, New Age Tantra. All right. So, oh. Uh, where to where to go with this? All right, so like in the New Age Tantra community, like no one discusses, and I don't uh, the hyperdimensional component. 
of like all this like louching and sexual energy and like yeah 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 it's like yeah cuddle puddles and all this kind of stuff and then no one checks how clean their energy is so like like in the tantric community in men and women like i can like i know when my energy is like being sucked from some like sucker by um type energy or succubus to energy it's like you, there's a when there's all this loose sexual energy and no one's embodying and owning that container of what their sexual energy is, it just looses onto children and it becomes like a virus onto children. So it's like you're trying to like spread this, this new age tantric type energy. It's like, well, there needs to be boundaries around this. Like boundaries are important. So all of this, 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 this super fluid love like it, it, it feels like it's going to be part of this journey to find wherever the boundaries are anyway, and you need to decide for yourself like where are your sexual boundaries. How are you looshing? Where's your leaky energy? I mentioned before about justice and how it feeds the disease. So when there's people in power and authority, including politicians, including um, people that are in in the in the law system. Um, it feeds the disease when there's no justice. Like when perpetrators can get away with with acts of violence, it's going to feed it. Um, repression, it's the same thing with um, the celibacy, repression and suppression. And then the hypocrisy. So um, like when, and this can be an energetic thing, like your your parents might be aroused by you, um, and I see this in a lot of um, of my work, my healing modality. My healing modality is where, like, um, like the mother puts the son on a, like a sexual pedestal, and vice versa. The father puts the daughter on a sexual pedestal. So it's like, oh wow, you're so beautiful. Yo, oh, wow, like, like, yeah, go, you go out and get those girls. Like you're you're my you're my king. Like you're my you're my boy. Go out and get those girls. Um, or go and get those boys, or whatever it is, like, um, um, like it feeds this unhealthy sex economy, which dovetails into pedophilia. Next slide, pedastry and romanticizing of youth. All right, so death is a reoccurring theme that we try and avoid. Mm. And pedastry was in Greece. It was a Greek thing where someone in a position of authority and power would take like a younger like a child or a boy on as like a a subject and they could have sexual relations and this was culturally disapproved and nothing was really done about it because it was people that were in authority that would do this um, like they might take a child in educate clothe them and part of this economy was they would have sex with the child so this is like it's like a, this this contractual transactional relationship where you take someone off a someone of a lower stature lower independence lower on the maslow's hierarchy of needs excuse me while i yawn and speak <laughs> you take someone from a lower stature lower maslow's hierarchy of need you take advantage of that by by getting sexual acts from them and then this is what this is what creates like this unhealthy sex economy and and maybe this is what the person wanted you know maybe and we can we can see this in in the extension in the sex industry with cam girls and other things and like in the um the sex positive world is where like no nah, sex is you know everyone should be allowed to do sex in whatever way they want to do it and it's just like when I went to the sex museum in New York and I watched two documentaries on cam girls, I felt fucking devastated because the women on those videos were not who they are. They were shells of themselves. I'm just picturing them now. I'm picturing some, seeing some of their faces now. They were shells of themselves and they were trying to justify this sex positive movement. And what the, the 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 tipping point here is like in Brazil, it's huge, and it's the way a lot of these people get money. 
And for me, that was like, oh my God, it's like, like you go, you, you, the, the only, the thing that pays them the best is being paid to be a, a cam girl. And, and if you have kids, like, this is the energy that's in the house. It's like, your body is a, a tool for men to get off on. And like, that's sex positive, right? So for me, how how you can preach against patriarchy, how you can preach against the dehumanization of women and the sexualization of children and the sexualization of adults and talk about sex positive and talk about then cam girls and prostitution in that same um, context is beyond me. How you can reconcile all of those is beyond me. Um, and... Like when I've spoken to people about prostitution in the past, it's like, oh, it's the oldest profession. It's just, yeah, well, so is mercenary. Like, so is being an assassin. It's like, well, let's have a conversation around like what's missing here. What is the connection that we are missing in humanity where we feel like we need these outlets and these outlets spawn trafficking and uh, dehumanization on a scale that we do not have the full transparency on. So back to my slide. Um, Pedastry and romanticizing of youth. So there's like this this thing around like getting a younger partner and like feeling younger. You know, there's this there's this notion of virginity and how like a woman who saves her virginity is like somehow more special and more pure and more something in in the aura or auric field wise and and fertility and and there's like this this legacy of like eternity by by having someone that is a virgin and younger than me then I am in this this realms of eternity so whatever the, I don't know what where this notion has come from um, however there's this romanticization romanticizing of youth in this space and I feel like there's some kind of connection here with pedophilia and child molesting where there's like this attempt to try and reconnect to your youth there's an attempt to reconnect to a part of you that was fragmented where you were not allowed or something else where you just you, you're missing it and you want to get it back in some way shape or form and i see that with um other disorders of, of sexuality and in my healing art and in other coaches and other therapists that have had similar conversations with people who are gay, bisexual, transgender, and have pedophilic tendencies. Like, everything is interwoven. And I think what, 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 what I find frustrating about, um, like, sexual disorders and how we try and normalize, um, normalize things, um, and I, it's not so much normalization, it's just letting it be. Like, there's, there's, there's a, a risk involved and I feel like the boundaries around innocence and consent so um like for homosexuality like for me like I've seen this play out where it the, the, the men involved tend to have a lot of hatred towards their father and for the women it can be mixed hatred towards their father or their mother or something else and like in same-sex relationships statistics wise there's more domestic violence in same-sex relations relationships than there are um, cis, what, heterosexual relationships. And that probably goes underreported on both sides of the spectrum there. So there's something in it. There's something in um, like a wanting to reconnect to self and feeling angry that you can't do it. It's not enough. There's something that's missing that, that, that I feel needs to be this teased apart in a loving way. Um, my next slide: cultural relativism and intersectional ideology and law. All right. So cultural relativism is like viewing another person's culture and choosing or not whether or not you want to influence it. So there's absolutism, which is where like you don't interfere um, because the cultural is pretty. The cultural practice is very much ingrained, and um, and there's cultural relativism, which is kind of which it is it's um like looking at a culture and like is, is it 
Is it, could, could it be changed? Should we change it? If we were to change it, like, what would it look like? Examples of this are, um, I've put on this slide, oh, my ears are ringing again, um, like female genital mutilation and circumcision. So, like, culturally, these are cultural practices. In Africa, this is a cultural practice. So, in the West, we might look at circumcision and, and female genital mutilation as like, well, hey, you're... What are you doing? <laughs> is it really necessary to still cut the skin off? Um, uh, the foreskin? Like, is it still necessary to do that? And the same thing with the female genital mutilation. I mean, it's it's penis mutilation. The one we, we call one thing circumcision, the other thing mutilation. So, and this is this is cultural. So, like... There's a lot of trauma that happens for a, for a boy when he's having his penis cut. And then even then, like, there's no... Um, it's very loosely regulated in in um, the developed world. Um, very loosely regulated. Um, at one point, you know, the penis used to get put in the mouth of the... of the... of the mole. I can't remember, the kind of, I don't know, I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly. Mule. Um... Um, before he cut, so like, or kiss the penis. There's a whole bunch of like, so in the Jewish community, there is going to be a lot of underreported child molestation because of the the risk of the tribe. They're very, very culturally protected subset of the population. And lots of um, like not wanting to bring condemnation on themselves which is part of their collective and um, ancestral trauma. So cultural relativism and inter intersectional idea, ideology. So in this, in this world of like LGBTQ+, plus, LGBTQ+, plus, yeah, the plus is kind of, it includes anything that's, that's a minority-based, so which in, can include like um, PAMs and pedophilia, where like they're trying to include... There's, there is a, there there is a movement trying to include underage attraction as a sexual preference, just like um, lesbian, bisexual, queer, and gay. So this is where intersectional ideology can become a rod for our own back, where we elevate people that claim victimhood or minority and there is elements of victimization here where like you are cast out for like not being able to get a house or like housing like being able to fulfill just your basic bo like needs as a human you are ridiculed for because you are you identify or you look a certain way is unacceptable like I mean, hell, we even had this with tattoos. Like, at one point, like, tattoos were looked at, at like, you are, you are a, you are an underclass if you had tattoos. Like, you were, you, there were the tattoos were associated with a prison class. So, it's like, now it's like, everyone's got a goddamn tattoo, and it's kind of reached a point of saturation where no one cares anymore. Or the generations that did care of kind of just whole bitter resentment for the rest of their lives until they die out. So, like, intersectional ideology, like, I understand what they're trying to do, and they, I feel like they're going about it in a wrong way by trying to shame you, by calling you, like, a racist or a bigot or, like, um, transphobic, transphobic, um, homophobic, and um, we might even start to see pedophobic. So, all of these slurs, which the conservative right may have used against us of, of like whatever it is is now being used by the left so this identity politics and this purity culture and the slurring culture is going to destroy any potential dialogue we have around let's 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 open it all up and look at where we need to place these boundaries around like whether it needs to be around innocence and consent around biology around like like how can we encourage a sexual healthy economy without impinging or stealing 
or taking somebody else's rights and autonomy. All right. Re-traumatizing on social media. Okay, one of the amazing women that I follow, um, she mentioned this. And then as soon as she mentioned it, on um, one of my clients happened to mention to me as well, like, he's been having all these weird fantasies and weird feelings around, like, getting aroused around, like, seeing, like, some of the, the, the shit that's going on on social media around the child trafficking. So... This is like the food. Like what are you feeding yourself um, in regards to what you're take, what you're ingesting? So, like everything that you read, everything that you listen to, everything that you scroll through is food. You're you are you are a sponge, whether you like it or not. You are absorbing environmental energy. You are when you go out into nature. Why do you feel better when you stand out in a forest or stand in the ocean or stand in a lake? Because you are absorbing that. So imagine yourself immersing yourself in social media, being re-traumatized by all the stories of child abuse, child abduction, all this kind of stuff. It's, 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 it's heavy and it's dense and I'm speaking in this place and if you're feeling stuff right now as I'm speaking, I recommend you take a break and come back to this later. Do not endure this. There is no need to endure because when you start to endure and you bypass it, you reinforce the splits of like not feeling like it, this is sad, this is traumatic, this is upsetting. This is your fellow human being being taken advantage of. This is your fellow human being. This is innocence being betrayed. And you have, a, you have every human... Every normal human response is to get angry and outraged and sad and disappointed and disgusted and all of those interwoven feelings. So, at the moment, we're seeing a lot of this people just posting stuff online about whatever it is. It's like, no, I'm doing it to draw awareness to it. You know, you, you should feel bad. You should feel angry. You should feel this. It's like, okay, all right. If that's coming from your heart, then fine. If it's coming from like this wounded, traumatized place yourself, what are you doing? Come on, like check in with yourself. Come in, come back into your heart. Take a break. Touch a tree. Touch a plant. Talk to your plants. Go water your plants. Go do something. Have some nourishing food. Like hug a tree. Take a bath. Whatever it is, like come into yourself and ground into your heart. Breathe into your heart. Operate from that space. Okay, now we're going to start to get into some more abstract. Q, child trafficking, adrenochrome, and MK Ultra. Wow, here we go. And if this if this doesn't excite you, then by all means you can stop here. And thank you for listening this far. So, another sip of water. Q and on, child trafficking, adrenochrome, MK Ultra. So this is this is where we start slipping into the realms of the otherworldly, the uncanny, and just the like matrix stuff, like architecture, like what's what what's going on in this 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 underbelly of the world. Like when you lift up the when you turn off the matrix code, like who's the who's the who's the compiler? Like who's the who's the coder in the background? Like what is really going on? So for like Q brought a lot of stuff into the service and for me like I've distanced myself from the whole Q concept and like it's just like it's not relevant to me. Every time I check in with my heart, it's like, do I need to read this? No. Is this important for me? No. Like does my head want to know about it? Yes. Is it gossipy? Yes. Like it, it, there's a loosh in it. Like there's a there's an excitement that there's all this stuff that's going to come to the service. And like a lot of us that, that, that are in these worlds have been wanting, like gagging for like this kind of exposure. Like someone in a, in a higher power is going to like going to expose all of the corruption and like, and for me, like there, there feels like there's some, there's some truth mixed in with the lies. And whenever there's this these movements that come out of the woodwork, it's about discernment. It's about like 
what where is the information coming from like is this factual like there's some really good charts on like gauging information and and for me a lot of it just boils down to my heart excuse me like does my heart even need to know about this like excuse me again not the child trafficking like it's 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 a thing it's been going on for a long time and it's devastating and i'm sure more will come to the surface over the coming months um yeah it doesn't feel like i need to go into much detail about that um adrenochrome and this concept of like um the elites milking the adrenal glands of terrified children um for satanistic type rituals and like for me Again, like it's it's it, 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 the humans are capable of great evil, and and I heard recently yesterday I heard recently like like the Illuminati were actually the enlightened ones that came to the Earth to free them, and they got corrupted, so they started to use all their powers against the Earth, which included part of like the MK Ultra project of like recruiting people that are men and women children who are gifted spiritually and corrupting them through child trafficking projects and, and um, adrenochrome and projects and, and MK Ultra. So trying to use them as weapons against the rest of the population or just trying to disable them. And for me, like, I say that and, like, is it relevant to my life's work? It's not relevant to my life's work. It's important that it, it sits on my bookshelf of knowledge and it's not relevant to my day to day. It's not relevant to how I really connect to people. Every time I drop into my heart space, I just feel the pain and the anguish and the human condition. And I feel like getting outraged about people that could be doing this is not it's not doesn't help because it's 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 in the self all the healing is within the self they are fragments of me i am fragments of them the more i heal of myself the more truth will come to the surface the more people will fall on swords the more grief will come to the surface i'll also add like adrenochrome can be synthesized um so it it boils down to well is it the then it it is the the energetic component that plays a part in that. So, um, which is where like people that aren't meant to research do research and then claim it as truth. So it's like, just some of y'all <laughs> just need to like sit down, stop researching, shut the fuck up and just connect to your own divinity because getting sidetracked into like doing all this research is not for you because you do not have the skills to do it. Um, so, and that's in another one of my podcasts about open head, with human design. Like, 70% of you all are not made for research. Like, you're not here to research. You are here to connect to the divine and give feedback. Um, like, it's just, you're just not. And you exhaust yourselves doing it. Like, oh, I've got to find out this, got to find out. That's like, if it doesn't, if it doesn't, like, fill you with a love and passion about now you know what i need to get to the bottom of this because i want i need to share this from a grounded loving place it's not for you stop doing it give yourself a break have a kit kat hyperdimensional and lower self this is i love this because like for me like the the, the non-humans the lower self avoidance and the hooks all feeds into this like this big this larger picture of the world mm. So, like, in order for, and I feel the, the, the how well, oh, that would be a good way to go. That's how, I'll, that's how I'll handle this. I'll look at it. If I was to treat someone that, that came to me that had pedophilic tendencies or philic tendencies that they just had trouble with, it would be about a regression and, and connecting back to that inner child and being able to own the lower self about taking advantage of someone that's innocent. Um... And then, um, hmm, interesting. And then putting opposite them, like I do, there's a lot of voice dialogue in some of my techniques. And like, 
her getting them to have a conversation with her, like a, a mature child, like in front of them, like just you know, create from a heart space, like this, this a, a version of a child that they feel like that they would be attracted to, just having a conversation with that child um, and just see where that goes. Um, and just in, in, see how that affects like, the assumption behind um, like what's going on in them. Like the, the, the exposing that and having a witness for that is super powerful. Mm, interesting. Make a note of that. Um, so hyperdimensional and lower self. So whenever we don't own these these fragmented parts of ourselves, like cathartically own, like bodily own, like rage, and like in Ista we do like um, like pelvic release and tantruming and all kinds of stuff to like own these parts of our body and just lose control. You got to lose control. If you don't lose control, you're still holding on and you're not going to get the deep healing. So, um, but when you release all of those, the, the cathartic stuff, the hooks go. The, the, the hyperdimensional components that want to feed off you and loose off you, they, they don't have the power anymore. They're no longer ish, interested in like the fear and the, and the sexual energy and the stickiness and like all of that, that stuff that comes from not being able to own your sexual sexuality. So when that energy starts to deplete, like, the the overall um, feeling of of the collective elevates, and it allows more people to own their sexuality. It allows more people to own their shadow and their their lower self, which is where we which is where we're going anyway. Like it's it's it's, it's happening. Like we've already we've already won, and it's happening. And I still and we all still need to do what we're doing. Um. All right, I'm a last slide here. Hmm. And the relevance to all of this, like, like, why do you give a fuck? Like, why is this important to you? Like, why do you care about pedophilia? Why do you care about um, child molestation? Like, what is it? Like, what is it for you that that brought you to this this podcast? Like, like, is is being fed by what's going on on social media correct for you? Like is is that is that what you're here to do? And then you can apply that to everything that you get outraged about. Like, is this relevant to you? Like, are you trying to change yourself or trying to bring attention to outrage? Because you want to see change, and you, you don't feel like you can do it by yourself. And outrage feels good. Like it feels really good to have that moral high ground. Like, yeah, like, I'm doing this, so therefore I'm better than you. Like, I don't have any mental health issues. I've never seen a therapist, and look at me, I'm fine. Like, the outrage and, and that, the, 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 the sense of, like, superiority. Oh, it's delicious. It's like crack. I've never had crack. It's like, what's a food I really enjoy? It's like pizza. <laughs> oh, gosh. Even then, like... If, if you're familiar with Pizzagate, it's like no one's ever going to be able to say pizza again without it like having some kind of connotations to child trafficking. So, like term-wise, it's it's become like it, it, it creates this this storm where it creates more loose and more shame and more guilt and more more everything um, because we we don't own. We don't own our sexuality. We don't own who we are, what we are, um, and allow the freedom to talk about it. And the healing modalities that we use to try and address these are just lax. They're just non, non-efficient. Like they're they're forked from the body and the mind to just the mind. And um, I, I feel that the DSM is helpful and it is not. And what are you avoiding? Um, like the dissonance in the shadow. So you're avoiding yourself. And I, and I see like, like, with the, the same sex marriages, like, the issue is never same sex. The issue is marriage. Like everyone wants to, feels like marriage is like this, this threshold you have to hit in order to, to be in a relationship. It's like, I don't give a fuck about same-sex marriage. 
Like, I'm talking about shadow and dissonance here. Like, it's about marriage. Marriage is the issue. Um, and then being able to legally give, like, like, um, like your property to someone that you love. Like you're creating a will around it, like it's marriage bypassed. Marriage was able to bypass a whole bunch of other contractual nonsense. Like, dependency and like, um, like if you're married to someone, it's like, oh, you're either dependent, you know, so you can split income. Um, there's like l- children's rights. There's a whole bunch of things around like um, that marriage just shortcuts that instead of you have to go to a lawyer and organize separately. And even like in Australia, like a six-month relationship can become de facto. So in at that six months, like somebody, that person can take half of everything that you have. And for me, that blows my mind like in 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 relationships you've got a three six and nine month period for women to 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 establish up where the relationship is going like like three months there'll be a chicken six months there'll be a chicken and nine months there'll be a chicken i've probably mentioned this in multiple podcasts previously um and the other thing is is biomarkers so the dsm doesn't have biomarkers for disorders so when we start talking about, oh, you're born with this, or, you know, this is this is part of who you are, it's like, well, okay, well, show me the fucking biomarkers then. Show me the genes. Show me this. Show me that. Like, show me in your body, if you are born with something, that that behavioral trend is identified in a genetic marker of something. It's not. So nature, nurture. So there's something within how we are raised, and it could be something ancestral, it could be something in the womb, it could be something that's epigenetic, that, that that shapes our sexual proclivities and and that is okay it feels like this is the growth path we need to go through in order to expose and understand who we are so like there's a there's a balance like a stead, steady she goes like there's a balance here and it feels like <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mind it because I like for me like I, I I deeply connect with with um like discord and um like balancing and truth and harmony and it feels like sometimes you just need to be stretched you just got to be stretched to the both ends of the spectrum and then like just let go and just like <sighs> what happens like where are we at what's going on and just have those this find those people that that offer those sage words and advice um i follow i, I follow some incredible men and women and i'm i'm truly grateful that i've come across them um in in my life and I'm, so i'm truly grateful for social media because there's a good chance i would not have come across these people so like, i feel like you fine tune your feed which comes back into relevance like who gives a fuck is what you're looking at on social media the fuck you want to give? Because I feel like a lot more energy could be spent um, looking at yourself and what's going on in you. And I can feel this coming to a close. Um, ah, there is an incredible... I'm just jump, jumping back to my last slide, my, my studies that I looked at. There is an incredible... Um, study it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, pe- uh, um, tw- from 2017. It's called the the politics of being a pedophile. It was it was someone's masters. He submitted it for his masters. I'm assuming it was a he. Could be a she. In 2017, it's incredible. Like you got to check it out if you if you really want to understand this. Um, it was it was it was heartfelt. It was critical, and it it was it was it was correct like it feels like if that's where we want to like if we really want everyone if we really want healing if we really want to see healing if we really want to see a level playing field then it feels like this is where um we we can take this is is, and i recommend just checking this that masters out if you've listened this far thank you so much I've just noticed the counter in my um, recording software has stopped. So I hope 
But, oh, no, it's moving. Yeah, good job. Okay, it's moving in, in correlation with the slides. All right, good. There's something going on there. Don't know what it is. The file size could be quite large. Oh, two hours. Sweet mother of some form of deity. Um, thank you for listening this far. And um, I deeply, deeply, deeply appreciate your time and your presence and any feedback that you have to give. And if this feels correct for you and you want to share it, then please do that. I would, I would deeply appreciate that. And I have so much love for you all. And spend some time. Have a rest. Have a break. If you listen to this in the one hit, have a break. Please have some water. Please go reset yourself. Please come back into your body. Like get on some massage material. Like Get out those knots, whatever it is. And, um, and love yourself. Love you. Um, you are free. And I love you. Big love. Peace.